Welcome to Navara Live. I'm Michael Walker and I'm joined by Dahlia. Gabriel, Dahlia, how are you doing? Hi, Michael. I'm doing okay. I'm a little bit under the weather today, but I'm muscling through for, for all you guys. Yeah, I'm, I'm teetering on the edge of something. Um, I'm feeling slight. I, I think it's the, the change of seasons maybe does something weird to the immune system. I'm not sure what's going on. Um, obviously, tonight we are going to be talking mainly about Meghan Markle, who has said she will not be attending the coronation. Um, you will be pleased to know that Prince Harry will be. So some of the family will be getting together. Um, of course, that will avoid some awkward conversations. Loads to talk about. We've got loads of guests, lots of different royal correspondents, um, lots to look forward to. Um, I'm, that, that's not true. We're talking about the Good Friday Agreement, Biden visiting Northern Ireland, um, Elon Musk, lots of very, very significant, important things um, this evening. US President Joe Biden has arrived in Ireland to mark the 25th anniversary of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. The Good Friday Agreement, which was signed in 1998, marked the end of the Troubles in Northern Ireland. The Troubles were sparked when a civil rights movement calling for equality for Catholics in Northern Ireland was violently suppressed by the state. The 30-year conflict would see British troops deployed on Northern Irish streets. It led to the growth of loyalist and Republican militias and left 3,500 people dead, many of them civilians. Brokered by the Blair government and the Irish Taoiseach Bertie Ahern, the Good Friday Agreement gave devolved powers to a Northern Irish Assembly, which would operate on the basis of power sharing between Northern Ireland's different political and religious communities. The agreement also laid a path towards Irish reunification, guaranteeing a referendum on unification if majority support for the move was to emerge. Joe Biden was a key player in pushing Bill Clinton to support the Northern Irish peace process in the 1990s. He gave this speech at Ulster University in Belfast today. Sometimes, especially when the distance of history, we forget how hard earned, how astounding that peace was at the moment. It shifted the political gravity in our world. Literally, it shifted the political gravity. In 1998, it was the longest running conflict in Europe since the end of World War II. Thousands of families have been affected by the troubles. Losses are real. The pain was personal. I need not tell many people in this audience. Every person killed in the troubles left an empty chair at the dining room table and a hole in the heart that was never filled for the ones they lost. Peace was not inevitable. We can't ever forget that. There was nothing inevitable about it. As a friend, I hope it's not too presumptuous for me to say that I believe democratic institutions established through the Good Friday Agreement remain critical to the future of Northern Ireland. It's a decision for you to make, not for me to make, but it seems to me they're related. An effective, devolved government that reflects the people of Northern Ireland and is accountable to them, a government that works to find ways through hard problems together it's going to draw even greater opportunity in this region. So I hope the assembly and the executive will soon be restored. That's a judgment for you to make, not me, but I hope it happens. That was a pretty clear steer from the US president to the unionists in Northern Ireland, still blocking power sharing installment. That's the DUP. They've refused to form an executive since February last year, citing their opposition first to the Northern Irish Protocol and now to the Windsor Agreement, which replaces it. That's meant the country's devolved government has been defunct ever since. But Biden's speech doesn't look likely to shift the stalemate. And the DUP have accused Biden of being, quote, anti-British. This was former DUP leader Arlene Foster on GB News. He hates uh, the United Kingdom. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, and um, I just think uh, the fact that he's coming here won't put any pressure on the Democratic Unionist Party at all. Quite the reverse, actually because he's seen by so many people as just simply pro-Republican and pro-nationalist. Foster was joined by other prominent DUP politicians in panning the president's visit. Nigel Dodds is the DUP's leader in the House of Lords. He told The Telegraph this. Pressure from an American administration which is so transparently pro-nationalist constitutes no pressure on us at all. Our decisions will be taken with the interests of Northern Ireland at the heart of our thinking. That's not what the Americans are about, especially Joe Biden a man who hates Britain, a bit like Ed Miliband's father. Obviously a reference to the Daily Mail article. I don't actually think Ed Miliband's father hated Britain. Very good Marxist author. 
And the visit also took place in the context of an uptick in violence in the six counties. Earlier this week, a small group of dissident Republicans held a parade in Derry that resulted in these scenes, a Northern Irish Police Service van being petrol bombed by the marchers. The parade was to mark the Easter Rising Rebellion against British rule in 1916. The police van went up in flames, but no one was hurt, thankfully. Then yesterday, four suspected pipe bombs were discovered in a cemetery, also in Derry and near to where the Easter March took place. A counter-terrorism investigation is now underway. To discuss recent developments in Northern Ireland and the significance of Joe Biden's visit, I spoke earlier to Sarah Creighton, a journalist based in Northern Ireland. I began by asking Sarah whether 25 years after the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, peace in Northern Ireland still feels secure. I think we've come very far from the Good Friday Agreement. You know, um, I've spent, you know, the past 25 years, I've grown up um, with relative peace. In Northern Ireland, um, my life hasn't been untouched by violence. Um, I was friends with Lyra McKee, um, you know, so I knew Lyra and, and that was obviously very devastating. But for the most part, I'm very lucky. You know, my life has been very much affected by, by violence. I haven't had the same experience as my parents or my grandparents. And I think it's important not to downplay that. And I can't see us going back to what we, we had before. I, you know, I think it's really important to say that. But, you know, I think we are in a very interesting difficult place at the moment um you know recently over the past couple of years you know, there have been outbreaks of rioting small scale obviously you know let's put it in perspective um in northern ireland um and we've had some violence from distant republicans you know recently a police officer was shot at rival you know loyalist drug gangs fighting in newtonards um the institutions however have collapsed completely um you know we don't have a government we really haven't had long-term sustainable government going on for a long time. And really, at this point in time, I do think we are reaching a critical point. It isn't clear whether the institutions are going to survive any longer. I think that it does feel quite fragile now. We are in a, in a place where I think a lot of people are asking, you know, are we really in a good place? Um, you know, what is going to happen going forward? I think a lot of people really are questioning the, the whether the institutions work in the long term, you know, some people from a nationalist Republican perspective would say, does Northern Ireland really work? Unionists would argue otherwise. Um, I think peace at the moment really just doesn't feel, it doesn't feel sustainable. I suppose that the status quo that we have now doesn't feel sustainable in the long term. You know, I think we've got to a juncture where things have to change. And I drew your attention to this in, in my Guardian article as well. You know, I think for a lot of people in Northern Ireland, they haven't seen the benefits of peace. They haven't seen the peace dividend, as it's called over here, and they really don't feel like they have gained anything after 25 years. And I don't think that's good enough. You know, I think we we need to have a change in the system. And where that comes from, I don't know. I think, you know, having a government instrument would certainly help. But, uh, you know, I think for a lot of people, you know, this this anniversary, 25 years of the Good Friday Agreement, I think has felt quite flat and quite sad, to be honest. You know, they really haven't felt like celebrating at all. That's particularly because Stormont is, you know, not sitting. Is is that why? So it's specifically is the, is the disquiet, the sort of disappointment because the DUP aren't joining the executive. If they had done that, do you think people would be feeling a lot more positive about the, the anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement? I think, yeah, I think there would be a little bit more positivity if there was a Stormont uh, that was operating and the parties were working together. Um, I think people would think, well, you know, we've, we've actually overcome something with people with working in government together. That is a huge change from what we had 25 years ago, where the DUP and Sinn Féin wouldn't even sit in a room together. They wouldn't even talk together on the news, let alone work in government together. That would be progress. Um, but I still think you would you would still hear those critical voices pointing out that the peace dividend is not being delivered to local communities. I think you would hear people say that the political system needs reform. You know, the fact that it, the rules in the Assembly are, 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 are made up so that either party really can bring the whole thing down if they choose to. Um, I think you would still hear a lot of um, questioning of the economic strategy that's been implemented in Northern Ireland after 1998. I think you would still hear a lot of calls um, for changes in the education system, um, you know, the benefit system, that type of thing in Northern Ireland as well. Um, so I, I don't think I don't think of the 25th anniversary, I think if we had government, I don't think it would be a complete positive complete positivity fest I think is one way to put it I still think people would would be quite critical but certainly I think if, if Stormont was back I think that would give people a little bit of a feeling of hope and I think for some people um I think really don't have a lot of hope in the system at the moment it's interesting uh, the way you're sort of focusing I suppose the competence of government or the the successful investment in communities let's say because I think when people talk about Stormont and the parties working together in the executive 
it's kind of just seen as, well, if all the identities or the significant identity groups in Northern Ireland are included, therefore we'll have peace and everyone will be happy. A devolved government also has to implement policies which, which work and which work for ordinary people. And I suppose looking at this from the outside, the idea that you can have an executive which includes basically people from all the different political parties with all their varying ideologies, that to me does sound like a bit of a recipe for, for deadlock. So is, there, is it potentially the case that the, the price of peace and everyone being included in this devolved government was that it is somewhat ineffective and prone to collapse? Yes, some people would argue that. So um, some people would argue that the Good Friday Agreement entrenches divisions in Northern Ireland. It permeates sectarianism in Northern Ireland. It encourages people to cling to, to uh, orange and green identities, um, that it doesn't encourage people to work together. So, you know, the Good Friday Agreement, you know, it really prioritizes civility, I suppose, over challenging historical wrongs over challenging, you know, over bringing forward reconciliation, you know, so a lot of, you know, victims groups in Northern Ireland would say that they feel quite left behind after 25 years, they feel forgotten about. Um, there are still are instances of sectarianism, you know, only this week there was a, a young child that was that was um, beat up um, in Derry because she was Protestant, you know, in East Belfast, there was a family a couple of months ago that had to leave their home because they were Catholic. These things are still ongoing. And, you know, when you look at that political leadership in Stormont, I don't really see that the political parties, DUP, Sinn Féin, I don't think they have done enough. I think collectively all the political parties in Northern Ireland have not done enough to challenge sectarianism and attitudes within their own communities. I don't think that, um, I think particularly I'm from, from the Protestant Unit tradition, I don't think we have done enough to encourage our history in Northern Ireland done on you know, the 70 years of unionist rule, Republicans and nationalists, I don't think have, have interrogated the legacy of, of violence in Northern Ireland and obviously both communities engaged in violence. But Definitely, you know, I, I think, you know, there's there's a lot to be to be said for reforming the institutions, but I, I think it needs to go deeper. As you say, I think it really needs to be, we need to interrogate ourselves going forward. It's not just about the institutions. You said something which struck out to me in your Guardian piece, because often when we talk about sectarianism in, in Northern Ireland, and especially in the last few years, when we talk about, you know, what challenges has the Good Friday Agreement faced, people talk about Brexit. And I think that's perfectly reasonable. Clearly, Brexit has caused disruptions to the constitutional settlement, which has created stress. You also say, though, 13 years of Tory austerity have allowed paramilitary groups to flourish in deprived areas. Could you talk about that less discussed aspect? So when people, um, when academics, when um, different groups in Northern Ireland have looked at this issue, one of the reasons that um, they have given for why paramilitary groups continue to exist in Northern Ireland 25 years after the Good Friday Agreement is because of poverty and deprivation within certain communities within Northern Ireland. So to give you an example of this, um, one thing that the paramilitaries will do is if somebody in the local community needs a loan, so maybe they have faced you know, a crisis situation, they can't pay their rent, you know, they can't pay a bill, they can't put food on the table. And, and I mean, we know through the universal credit system, for instance, that, that you know, there's a one month where people aren't being paid. So for a lot of people, they, they have weeks and weeks without money. So these groups will come along and say, well, we'll, we'll lend you the money. You know, we can't get it from a bank. You can't get it from your credit union. We will lend you the money and people will take this money. And then if they can't pay it back, you know, interest will be added on. The bill becomes extortionate. Those people can't pay it back. And in some cases, those groups will punish people. They will resort to violence. Some people will be intimidated out of their homes. In some cases, those people will be asked to work for the paramilitary groups and for those organisations. Um, in some of these communities, you know, where, where people don't feel like they have any prospect of getting a job, where they feel hopeless, where they don't feel like Northern Ireland is offering them anything. Sometimes these groups offer people a way to make money. Um, some people feel that they can rely on those groups more than they can rely on the state or the police. Um, I'm not from those communities, so I must be clear, I can't, I can't speak to their experience, but it is quite clear that the austerity that has come to Northern Ireland over the past 13 years has definitely entrenched these groups. It has made it harder for these for these groups to be to disappear. Um, so when the Tory government talks about you know peace in Northern Ireland, bringing prosperity and peace to Northern Ireland, it could actually do a lot for Northern Ireland by rejecting the agenda, um, rejecting the austerity agenda that it has tried to implement for the past thirteen years, not just in Northern Ireland but across obviously the whole United Kingdom as well. Finally, I mean, you've talked about a lot of problems that Northern Ireland is facing at the moment. The Biden visit, does it have any relevance to any of them? I mean, is is this a positive thing? Is this just a photo opportunity? What do you make of it? You know, Biden came, he gave a speech, you know, it was very positive. You know, we talked about, you know, prosperity and investment in Northern Ireland. He talked about, you know, we encouraged the 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 the, the parties to work together. But really, it was a bit of a nothing burger. You know, he didn't really put much pressure on the DEP. I mean, that was probably the right thing to do, to be honest, because I don't think they would listen to me if he did. Um, I haven't really felt as positive about the visit as other people. 
you know, there was a lot of talk about the investment opportunities from the United States and, and you know, how great all this is. But, you know, we have had some U.S. investment to varying degrees over the past couple of years. It hasn't really resulted in a lot of wealth on the ground. You know, the lack of an executive over the years meant that we have been able to take certain policy decisions to address systemic problems like housing. You know, my, in my day job, I work for, for a housing charity. You know, I, I deal with this um, every day. Um, I, I think it has been a bit of a photo opportunity. I don't think this visit will be remembered. I think it will come and go. I, I don't think it's going to be the same as the Bill Clinton visit that was the, that happened during the 90s or even when Barack Obama came to Ireland a couple of years ago. So I, I, to me, it was it was really just a bit of a photo opportunity. I think it was more really about um, Joe Biden's optics overseas. Um, so, you know, I, I, I have quite a negative view of it, to be honest. Um, but look, you know, hopefully something positive will come for it. But I, I don't I don't see that going forward. The junior doctors are out on strike with a second of their four day long industrial action. Their demand is pretty reasonable. They want pay restored to levels they had in 2010. But so far, they've been getting a pretty hard time from the media. And the billionaire press are willing to use anything to try and damage the cause. This is a headline from The Times. Militant BMA union chief goes on holiday. As junior doctors strike, it says Robert Lawrence and a former public school boy is attending a friend's wedding while thousands of his colleagues sacrifice their pay to make a stand. This one's from The Telegraph. Union boss on holiday as junior doctors start four day strike. BMA co-chairman Dr. Rob Lawrence criticized for, quote, swanning off to attend wedding amid ministers' attempts to negotiate with members. Now, I don't think those attempts are particularly serious. So what's the actual story here? Robert Lawrenson is co-chair of the BMA's Junior Doctor Committee and just one of the many doctors who've appeared in the media to speak about the strike. It's true, he has gone on holiday. Sky News reports this. A union spokesperson said he was fulfilling a long-standing commitment to attend the wedding of a family friend, adding, we aren't going to disclose further personal information, but he remains actively involved in the planning of the disputes. The story here is essentially that someone took annual leave, um, even if it's potentially an, an unfortunate time to have that wedding, an unfortunate clash. Um, it's worth pointing out that Steve Barclay is still refusing to meet, let alone negotiate with the doctors. I'm joined now by Dr. Parth Patel, a junior doctor in the NHS and a senior research fellow at the IPPR. Um, I want to know first, the doctors are taking a hammering from the press, as I've said. Um, is that getting striking doctors down? I think there's two things to say here. I think the first set of strikes the junior doctors took a few weeks ago didn't get very much press attention at all. And that got quite a few doctors down saying mm, people aren't really that interested in us. Um, this time around, it's been quite a different story. It has been front page news, um, but it's not been so friendly overall. Um, I think I think that will irritate some people. But broadly speaking, the public seems to be on the side of the doctors. I think People, most people up and down the country have used the NHS over the past 10 to 15 years. They've seen the transformation within the NHS and therefore they've understood the transformation and what it is to be a doctor in this country. They're pretty empathetic that it has become harder. It's become more challenging and less rewarding. You're being asked to do more and more or less and less. And people understand that. And people understand that doctors are dissatisfied. And what these strikes are is an expression of that dissatisfaction. And um, I'd rather sort of be here using my voice and striking than I would be sort of having my doctors leaving this country and going practicing elsewhere. All trade unions, big democratic organizations full of, you know, very lively internal debate. I and mean, what is the sense among doctors at the moment? Are, are people pretty sure that this is the right strategy to go down? It was a fairly, you know, I mean, I don't think it's extreme because I think you deserve your pay restored, but it's a, you know, it's a, it's a fairly bold move, this four day strike. Is there a lot of unity behind that or are there sort of growing voices saying, oh, maybe we should do fewer days next time, for example? Most doctors aren't um, <laughs> industrial dispute experts and certainly not versed in how union disputes work. Um, and put their trust in the membership body that represents them. I think there's broad consensus that doctors have felt a really steep pay cut, you know, sort of whichever way you add up, whatever inflation market you look at, it's been one of the steepest pay cuts across professions in the UK. And I think people are feeling that that just feels a bit too much because at the same time, it's not that we're being rewarded less. You're also being asked to do more. The country's gotten older, it's gotten sicker. We haven't had policy in to stop people getting sicker. And so then you have to do more as a doctor. Um, and there's general um, agreement on that front. Um, in terms of what the 35% figure means, that's sort of anyone's guess, really. It feels like it's a negotiation tactic. The broad idea is that we want pay restoration. We want pay to be back at the levels it was in 2008 relative to the price of everything else. How we get there, I think, is a different question. I don't think people are saying we need 35% tomorrow, um, but we want to see a 
clear route towards getting back to that kind of pay standard. I've done some media on this, um, obviously defending your guys' position, which I'm wholeheartedly behind. Um, uh, something which you know opponents have often put forward is say the nurses have accepted 5%, why are the doctors asking for more? I mean, is, is the fact that various groups within the NHS have gone on strike separately, potentially sort of a, has that created some division which potentially weakens your bargaining position? What, what do you make of that? Yeah, that's a really, really excellent question. Um, and I mean, I don't know what the dynamics behind that are. There clearly was some unity between the, the unions that represent non-doctor healthcare staff. That's nurses, physiotherapists, healthcare assistants. There was a group of unions there negotiating with the government and they had a slightly less acrimonious relationship with the government. They also went on strike and then eventually the government decided, it asked itself the question, what do I need to do to press pause on these strikes? And it put down an opening offer that then was negotiated quite intensively for a week or two that convinced the, the union that actually this feels reasonable. Let me take it back to my members. I wouldn't say the nurses have accepted it yet. The union has said it, it's going to take it to its members and the members are yet to say whether they accept or reject it. There was a slightly different approach there taken by the government, not one of acrimony or antagonism. With the junior doctors, the government is saying, actually call off the strikes and then maybe we can talk. That's not really how this is going to work. Um, and already we've seen that line soften on both sides, uh, to, be, to be fair. Rishi Sunak has said, we're willing to talk. The BMA union has said we're willing to negotiate on the 35%. That feels like a softening on both sides. I suspect we will start to see some talks over the next two weeks. The really key question here for the government, if I was the government, I'd be asking myself, where do I need to set pay to get NHS waiting lists down? The question about paying how much you pay doctors is pretty much the same question as how good you want your NHS to be. And now the prime minister has said he wants to bring NHS waiting lists down. And they've set out a quite an ambitious plan to do that over the next three years. That is going to be impossible without more doctors and more staff in the NHS, which is essentially the same way as saying, all right, how, do I, how high do I need to raise pay to pull people back into that, the, the, the NHS out of, out of sort of not participating in the labour market or fleeing this country to Australia or New Zealand? And that's a really big question. The government needs to work out what that number looks like. It needs to put that forward. Thank you for pointing out that I was incorrect to say the nurses have accepted it because it is the unions have recommended their members accept it. And we've actually spoken mm -hmm. to nurses on this show who are outraged um, that the unions came to that agreement. So it doesn't seem to me sort of a, a given mm -hmm. that they will accept that. So very important point there. Um, can you talk to our audience, I suppose, about, you know, you're obviously not going to be in that negotiating room, but what are the key things to come out of this? Is it nearly all about pay or are there sort of agreements about conditions that could also make a difference here? Or is that is that almost a separate issue? Well, it's certainly not a separate issue. I'd say it's almost as important as an issue. And the, so many doctors are saying we're not just on strike because of our pay. We're on strike because we can't practice the kind of medicine we've all trained to, to provide. So six to eight years to train how to be a good doctor, not just to try and stop some kind of patient safety incident happening, but actually to offer a bit of dignity to someone and to provide a high level kind of care. People in my generation, we that's just been something you learn in a textbook. It's been impossible to provide that kind of care in the NHS. Um, and that's what we want to change. You know, we want to be able to provide the kind of kind of care that people that well, our patients we have a duty to look after, they deserve. And that's not possible. That's partly because the system is so stretched and we want that to change. Um, and I think that's quite a big dimension of this here. The union has also said that actually we're not just on strike on behalf of Doctors Bay. We're on strike because the NHS is crumbling and we need a way to rescue it. That, of course, involves more resource, but it also involves reform. And we haven't got a plan on that. No one has put up a credible plan to try and pull the NHS in the 21st century so that it functions what modern democracy like the UK wants. Something I found so striking about this dispute and the way the government are talking about healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, healthcare assistants, whoever, is that so, so recently we had politicians who were out every Thursday clapping on their doorstep to say, you know, we appreciate nurses, carers, doctors. And my impression, you know, potentially naively, I thought, look, after the pandemic ends, we've put doctors, nurses, healthcare assistants through hell. Um, presumably we're going to reward them afterwards. We're going to change our perspective on, on the significance of essential jobs and value them as they should be valued. That doesn't seem to have happened. They're saying you need to now accept a real terms pay cut. I mean, is there a sort of feeling of of betrayal? And do you think that's potentially why the doctors, I don't want to use the word militant, but why the doctors mm. seem so determined to to not accept crumbs here? Is it is it because people feel like, look, we went through hell, we thought you were going to value us, you haven't, we're actually pretty pissed off now? I think there probably is some truth in that. I think the gestures that have come so far have been gestures and they broadly feel quite vacuous. Um, it feels like the tide had changed in terms of how people were perceiving doctors and healthcare staff in those two years. 
and all of a sudden that's just been forgotten and the job has somehow managed to get even harder despite us coming out of the pandemic and you see colleagues in other countries including in Wales and Scotland getting um, a remuneration bonus for working in the pandemic that did not happen in England so that feels very much like it's part of the picture yes I think I agree with that um, and I mean I mean, I think, Michael, it probably speaks to a broader problem here with the British economy, right? Not just the public sector, but actually the British economy writ large in the sense that we have this kind of mesmerizing mismatch between the contribution certain workers make to the economy and the reward they get for it. And that gap just seems to be growing and growing. And of course, doctors are part of that, but so are nurses and healthcare staff and bus drivers and lorry, lorry drivers and bin cleaners. And it's, there's, there's a reason there's certain types of people on the streets and protesting in this country, also in France and in many other industrialized economies, is that gap between the contribution you think you're making to society and you know you're making it to society because as soon as you stop, society stops, but the reward you're getting for it is, is, is shrinking. And that <laughs> leads to a whole different set of reforms. I think that extend far beyond how much do you pay doctors. The junior doctor's strike has brought out a lot of bad commentary from our political class. On LBC though, Ollie Dugmore from Politics Joe hit the nail on the head. Are junior doctors pay demands fair? That's what uh, Cara wants to know. Yes. So would you, how would you pay for it? Is that all you have to say? Like, uh, well, I mean, we can get into it. How would I pay for yeah, it? Yeah, how would you pay for it? Where are you finding that money? Taxes. Okay. Tax the rich, tax them until the pips squeak. So, so it, one gen of the genuinely, what, what taxes are you raising? Hang on, who am I arguing with? Let Ollie set out his stall. Um, there is money. There is money. There is money in our political system. Where it gets spent is a political choice. Let's talk about the £4 billion in unusable PPE, a lot of which that money went to Conservative Party cronies, peers, donors. It is an ethical choice how we spend money in government. And I would challenge people in this country that if they want to go out and they want to clap for the NHS during a pandemic when we were literally sending them into hospitals to confront a disease that we didn't know anything about, sometimes wearing bin liners, that we, those people deserve fair pay. They're not, they're not actually asking for an extraordinary pay rise. They're asking for the restoration of what they were paid in 2008. That's not an unreasonable demand. So do you think part of the solution might be for the government to come forward and say, OK, we get that you've lost this money since 2010. We, we accept that. We accept mm. that part of your argument. We can't give you 35% now. You, you don't expect it. There's no way that we can do that. But over the next three, four, five years, we will do it. And here's the proposal. Yeah. Now that, to me, would be the logical way it's forward. Called, it's called negotiation. No, but here. Ian, I, I'm sorry, everybody has lost out. I'm sorry, Ian, everybody has lost out. Now that final argument was from Kate Andrews. She was formerly spokesperson for the billionaire-funded Institute for Economic Affairs. She is now economics editor at the Right Wing Spectator, which is also owned by a billionaire. That means she should really know that not everyone has, in fact, lost out over recent years. In December last year, the Equality Trust found that the number of billionaires in the UK had increased by 20% since the start of the pandemic. That's in large part due to asset price rises and also there was a boom in the stock market. And this is from the Guardian write-up of the Equality Trust report. So the report found that the number of billionaires in the UK had risen more than tenfold from 15 in 1990 when the Sunday Times first published its rich list after taking into account inflation over that time period. Using inflation-adjusted wealth data from archived copies of the rich list, it said the combined wealth of Britain's billionaires had risen from £53 billion in 1990 to more than £653 billion in 2022. This represents an increase in billionaire wealth of over 1,000% over the past 32 years, the report said. Dahlia, Kate Andrews, thinks everyone's lost out. So, we'll, you know, doctors, nurses, everyone should accept a pay cut because everyone's lost out. Why can she not see um, the people who have gained from this who just so happen um, to, well, own the newspaper she currently works for and fund the organisations she worked for beforehand? Maybe she hasn't been invited to uh, her boss's cocktail party, so she doesn't know... Uh, how her billionaire bosses are living, you know, how the, the super rich of this country uh, have not only barely been touched by the crisis that has ravaged our living conditions, but have actually thrived uh, and made a lot of money out of those uh, conditions. But you are completely right, Michael, to highlight the fact that Kate Andrews is, you know, one of the many pundits that we are subjected to who have been reared by the Institute of Economic Affairs. Uh, we have to remember that the IEA is also 
uh, the ideological driver or was the ideological driver between the catastrophic crisis that was Trussonomics, uh, which tanked the economy. If we had a normal media, they would not allow anyone who was associated with such a discredited economic project to be on TV acting like an expert when it comes to to economic affairs. Uh, and when she says, you know, everyone's lost out, obviously, as you've pointed out, the cream of the crop, you know, the 1% of the 1% have actually gained a huge amount from um, the economic chaos that we're all suffering from. But even if you were to take it into good faith and say, yes, like the vast majority of people uh, in this country have lost out of this economic crisis, which has, you know, started in 2010 and is continuing today under the management of the Conservative Party, I would say, well, that's thanks to your economic ideology, the economic ideology that organizations like the IEA have foisted upon us by having a constant media presence and constantly shifting the Overton window and shifting our framework on whether or not we are allowed to scrutinize government decisions on spending um, to constantly shift that to to the right. But, um, you know, when it comes to uh, what Ollie said, Ollie was completely uh, right. Decisions on where to place and how to distribute the vast amounts of wealth that exist not only in the British economy, but in the global economy, those decisions are political. And the fact is, is that this government has made the political decision to refuse to even sit down to the negotiating table to discuss with junior doctors what restoration of pay would look like, which, by the way, to, to restore government, to restore junior doctors pay, which is being p portrayed as such a radical and unreasonable demand, would cost one billion pounds. That is a drop in the ocean when it comes to government spending, for example, on the billions of pounds of COVID contracts that went out to their crony mates, the 37 billion pounds that went out on track and trace, a track and trace system that, as we all experienced, was pretty much a spectacular failure. The £4 billion on PPE that was unusable. When it comes to coughing up the cash that will enrich uh, their fellow class travellers, there is no problem with shelling out billions and billions of pounds. What the £1 billion it would take to restore doctors' pay could be found in the back of the sofa. But there is a political decision here to A, um, lower the bar of expectation that we have for what a government should provide, and also to send the clear message that labor organizing, that trade unions will not be engaged with or listened to, to try and essentially break these strikes. I think it's very important that we begin to understand this and we begin to have more voices like Ollie in the media who can really say that these are not natural laws of economics, but these are concrete political decisions made by a government that for whom it will never be enough. The tax cuts will never be enough. The spending cuts will never be enough. The lowering of wages of public sector workers will never be enough. They see it as a class war and a class struggle to get the most that they can out of this economy for them and their mates. And we should start seeing it in the same way. Remember Liz Truss. She was the 49-day Prime Minister who used her short time in office to crash the economy, causing interest rates to rise and compounding the cost of living crisis. Never mind though because somehow it turns out that people are still interested in what she has to say. Truss is in Washington at the moment, where she's given a speech to conservative think tank, the Heritage Foundation. The main theme was that the British state is too big. Instead, we need to foster a low tax, low regulation environment to support growth. Of course, that begs the obvious question, why did it all go so wrong when Truss tried it? Well, this was her diagnosis. We've allowed our opponents to fill the airwaves. We've allowed them to crowd our campuses. And we've allowed them to use our institutions to undermine our values. We share a great heritage of freedom between our two countries. You know, the US Constitution, Magna Carta, there are many founding documents that I could mention. But that freedom is being undermined. And of course, we need to be self-critical. We, we should subject ourselves to self-examination. We believe in a free press. But what I think it's come to is self-flagellation. Self-flagellation of the values that made 
our countries great in the first place. Identity politics, which is basically the idea that what group you're in is more important than the person you are. Critical race theory, which says it's more important how you appear on the surface than what your talents and attributes are. Or the whole debate about what is a woman <laughs> that completely subverts basic principles of science and biology. These are all core beliefs that we have seen being undermined. And I'm afraid there hasn't been sufficient fight back. Being a conservative is so easy. You can just say anything, then pause and say, identity politics. <laughs> Critical race theory. What is a woman? I didn't have any relationship to what she was talking about beforehand. Dahlia, were you convinced by that speech? Why did her government crash and burn? What is a woman? All over the airwaves. They've let their, their opponents flood the airwaves with critical race theory. Was that, was that why her government fell so quickly? The fact that Liz Truss is, you know, shamelessly, she talks about, you know, this culture of self-flagellation. I think when I look at Liz Truss, I'm like, you don't self-flagellate enough um, because she truly is. The fact that she's still not only out and about, but out and about being asked her and paid to give her opinion on governance um, is honestly a testament that, when you're in a certain class, you can literally just endlessly fail upwards. If I tanked the entirety, if I turned up to work and tanked the entirety of Navarra's finances with a series of decisions that everyone told me not to make, I probably wouldn't then get a gig as like a media consultant or like, um, you know, go walking around and telling everyone how to run a business. I would probably lose my job and have to never be part of the sector again as would be probably correct. But I really do also think that Liz Truss blaming the Wokarati uh, for why she crashed the economy um, is completely laughable. Blaming the Wokarati for the fact that the IMF, which is literally the regulating institution of neoliberalism, like the institution that enforces neoliberal economics around the world to great detriment of uh, economies, particularly in the global South. The fact that her policies were so rapidly neoliberal that the IMF had to intervene, and she's blaming woke culture on that, really just goes to show that this whole idea of wokeness is a completely superficial, unsubstantiated concept. What it is, is essentially an emotive trigger word uh, that is used, that is hauled out by conservatives when they feel like they're losing the argument on, you know, the basis of substance and have to kind of trigger everyone and haul back a particular electorate back onto their side by evoking a word that will just trigger a set of emotions that people have around communities and things that they don't like, you know, whether it's migrants, whether it's trans people, whether it's people of color and stirring up those emotions in order to cover for the fact that they have nothing to offer. You know, as far as I'm concerned, I really think it reminds me a lot of that famous skit by Stuart Lee, where he talked about political correctness and how his nan was like confusing political correctness with like basic health and safety regulations and being like, oh, I can't get into like have a bath with my toaster anymore because it's political correctness gone mad. Literally, that's what it sounds like when Liz Truss talks about the IMF stepping in to be like, we love you being neoliberal, but you're going too far and you're going to tank the economy and her calling them the woke karate. That's literally, she literally sounds like Stuart Lee's nan. And the fact that she's being paid for that is honestly like an indictment on so many things I can barely even begin to name them. Elon Musk might usually come across as a bit of an out-of-his-depth dweeb. But in an interview with the BBC's James Clayton, there was at least one exchange where he came out on top. We have spoken to people who, who have been sacked that used to be in content moderation. And, and we've spoken to people very recently who were involved in moderation. And they just say they just, there's not enough people to police this stuff, particularly around, um, particularly around hate speech um, in the company. Is that well, what hate speech are you address? talking about? I mean, you use Twitter. Right. Do you see a rise in hate speech? 
I mean, I, I, but just a personal anecdote. Like, what did you? I don't p- personally. My uh, for you, I would see. I get. I get more of that kind of content. Yeah, personally. But I, I'm not going to talk to talk to the rest of for, for the rest of Twitter. So you see more hate speech personally. I would say I would see more hateful content in that. In that content moment. you don't like or or hateful. What do you mean to describe a hateful thing? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, just content that will solicit. A reaction, something that may include something that is slightly racist or slightly sexist, those kinds of, those kinds of things. So you think if I'm, something is slightly sexist, it should be banned? I, no, is I'm, that not, what you're saying? I'm not saying anything. I'm well, saying. I'm just curious. I'm trying to understand what you mean by hateful con- content. And I'm asking for specific examples. Um, and if, and you just said that if something is slightly sexist, that's hateful content. Does that mean that it should be banned? Well, you've asked me, you've asked me whether my feed, whether it's got less or more, it, I'd say it's got slightly more. That's what I'm asking for examples. Can, right. you, can you name one example? I, I honestly don't. I, I, honestly, you I don't. You can't name I, a single example. I'll tell you why, because I don't actually use that for you feed anymore, because I, I just don't particularly like it. You said actually, a lot of people, a lot of people are quite similar. I, I, I only, well, I only look well, at my, my followers. You said you've seen more hateful content, but you can't name a single example, not even one. I'm not sure I've used that feed for the last three or four weeks. And I, well, then how did you see the hateful content? content? Because I've been, I've been using, I've been using Twitter since you've taken it over for the last six months. Okay, so then you must have at some point seen the you for you hateful content. I'm asking for one example. Right. And, and I, you can't I, give us a single I, one. And, and, and I'm saying, I, I, then I, I say, sir, that you don't know what you're talking about. Really? Yes, because you can't give me a single example of hateful con- a content, not even one tweet. And yet you claimed that the hateful content was high. Well, that's a false. No, what I claimed. You just lied. What, no, no, what I claimed was, uh, there are many uh, organizations that say that that kind of information is on the rise. Now, whether whether it has on my Give me feed one or example. not, I mean, I, right? And you literally, can, can name something one. like the, the uh, Strategic Dialogue uh, Institute in the, U, in the UK. They will say that. So you, they, look, as people will say all sorts of nonsense. I'm literally asking for a right. single example, and you can't name one. Right. And as, as I already said, I don't use that feed. But let's, well, then how let, would you know? Let, that I don't you, think this is getting anywhere. You literally said you experienced more hateful content. And then couldn't name a single example. Right. And as I said, I that's absurd. I haven't, I haven't actually looked at that feed. I then would how would you know this hateful content? Because I'm saying that's what I saw a few weeks ago. I can't give you an exact example. Let's move on. We have, we only have a certain amount of time. Um, wow. Well, that was the moment he fucked up. I'm seeing in my for you feed lots more hateful content. And then he says, give me an example. Actually, I don't use my for you feed and I haven't used it for weeks. Dahlia, I mean, in that guy's defense, apparently he got. Very short notice to do the interview. I'm sure he was a bit terrified. The most high profile interview he's done in his life. But that mm. was that was bad, wasn't it? That was excruciating in many ways. And I think that had he, I don't know, had the time or, you know, was had the expertise. I think a lot of people who work in, you know, content moderation or whatever will have watched that and been like, you had a golden opportunity to like really put to Elon Musk like the problems that are going on in Twitter and you just fumbled it. So it was excruciating. It's not as much of a win for Elon Musk as I think it's being made out to be because I think of your entire argument that what's happening on Twitter is fine is resting on the idea that you can't come up with a concrete example of hate speech on the platform. It, like, it's going to fall apart pretty quickly, even though not in that interview. But I mean, come on, you know, like, it's ask any like, pro, you know, public or any black woman or woman of color with a f- mildly prominent profile. And she'll tell you there is like hate speech on the platform. But I think that this raises a lot of really complicated questions because Twitter is quite a, unique as a platform, more so than any other social media platform, I would say. It operates in a way that is quite similar now to a public utility. You know, this is not just a platform where people keep in touch with their friends. It's not just a platform where people even, you know, buy things. It is a platform that is used by governments to communicate with electorates, with the public. And the breadth of power as a communications infrastructure is unlike anything we've seen before. And the question of content moderation is a, in that context is a really tricky one. I don't actually have an answer to who should content moderate? How should content moderation take place? And, you know, what does it mean to moderate content on on a, or curate content on such a platform? You can't have a complete free-for-all because, you know, that's not how these platforms work. 
there is algorithmic curation. That is a fact. The question is, to what ends and under whose control? That is a really important question that I think journalists need to be educated in and need to be able to engage in and to spark that part. I wish we spent more time talking about that rather than, you know, talking about tofu eating woe karates and whatever it is that fills our airwaves these days. You know, it, it's a genuine question for our, you know, our generation. But what I do know is that the fact that these decisions are being held and are being made by a single individual who is, you know, clearly having some kind of insecurity issues and is trying to win a popularity contest on, you know, some kind of Reddit, like subreddit or, you know, on 4chan, that is a serious crisis um, for our public sphere and you know it is but I do think that it is a genuinely tricky question and I wish that you know the one time that we're actually getting to talk about this that it didn't happen in such a clownish way because it is genuinely an art something that I don't have an answer to and I would love to see more people who are more able to in an educated and reasonable way have that conversation rather than having an argument about whether or not hate speech exists on Twitter which Obviously, it does. Um, and as we've learned from um, Elon Musk, whole, you know, being in charge, owning Twitter, the people who curate and make those decisions at the top really shape how that platform gets used and how it is experienced and the impact that it has on public culture. Elon Musk shouldn't celebrate too much because if his defense, as you say, of Twitter is that you, you can't prove the receipts, I mean, People can prove the receipts. James Clayton just wasn't particularly well prepared to do so. Um, I mean, potentially because he's a white guy working at BBC, right? If this had been you or Ash or anyone, they could have. You, I'm, sure, I'm sure you could have gone through your Twitter mentions and showed him some of them. I mean, I, my message request is now just full of constantly fake bot women asking me to show them around various cities. This did not happen before Elon Musk owned Twitter. Very, very strange. It does seem like it's a badly managed organization. Um, also, in terms of the receipts, in terms of the data, um, if James Clayton had more time to get his notes together, he might have come armed with this study. It's from a New York Times report published last December. Before Elon Musk bought Twitter, slurs against black Americans showed up on the social media service an average of 1,282 dimes a day. After the billionaire became Twitter's owner, they jumped to 3,876 times a day. Slurs against gay men appeared on Twitter 2,500 times a day on average before Mr. Musk took over. Afterwards, their use rose to almost 4,000 times a day. An anti-Semitic post referring to Jews or Judah isn't soared more than 61% in the two weeks after Mr. Musk acquired the site. So that's a pretty quick change. Um, those figures are, according to research from the Anti-Defamation League in the US and the Center for Countering Digital Hate. Again, you might say, well, what do they define as hate speech? You'd have to look on the website. I'm sure they provide some receipts. Um, you might also think maybe it got better since then. Elon Musk has owned the site for a while. Well, it doesn't seem to have done. Last month, the Washington Post examined a study using machine learning very impressive, to monitor anti-Semitic content, it reported this. The analysis found an average of over 6,200 posts per week appearing to contain anti-Semitic language between June the 1st and October the 27th, the day Musk completed his $44 billion deal to buy Twitter. But that figure rose to over 12,000 through early February, a 105% increase. So those are the numbers going up that you don't want to see. Value of Twitter going down, hate speech going up. Um, the rise in hate speech on the platform may also have some real consequences for Musk. Germany, for example, which has pretty strict laws on hate speech, as well as other speech acts like denying the Holocaust. Well, last week, Germany's Federal Office for Justice, the BFJ, not sure what that stands for in German, launched proceedings against Twitter, threatening it with 50 million euro, with a 50 million euro fine for failing to deal with content that's illegal in the country. Germany's Minister for Justice told Forbes this... Numerous content was reported to the BFJ that was published on Twitter, which the authority considers illegal and despite user complaints was not deleted or blocked by the provider within the legally stipulated periods. The fine proceedings initiated are based on this. The internet is not a legal vacuum. Platforms must not simply accept it when their services are misused to disseminate criminal content. Now, I imagine that the, the German Federal Office for Justice um, will not accept a poo em emoji. Um, as 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 Elon Musk's response, which seems to be what he keeps messaging to journalists whenever they have questions. Although, as we've shown, in, in that three-minute clip, he did get the better of the BBC's James Clayton. You've been watching Navarra Media. Good night. Good night.